So primarily I'm going to be referring to uh, some of the content of this book, which uh, is Church Membership in the Bible uh, by Peter Masters. And uh, some of you will recognize that name because it's also right here. Peter Masters um, is the editor of this, this confession that we use. And I, I, you know, I'm not one who normally seeks out um, photo ops with famous pastors. <laughs> but I do happen to have just this one. Um, and so this is in the Metropolitan Tabernacle in London. And we are in the vestry of the church after the evening service there. And I think it was 2018. Marion and I took a 30th wedding anniversary trip to London. And the, the people there couldn't have been more gracious. It was such a, a, the whole highlight of our trip was our interaction with this church. But we're standing in front of Charles Spurgeon's pulpit. Uh, this was his church in the 1800s, and uh, you can barely see it, but just to the right on, of the pulpit, there's a clock, you know, that he used to time himself. Um, but um, on that trip, um, we went and visited on Friday evening and rang the bell at the church, and uh, his secretary, Helen, came and met us, and I think she was the only person in the building. She gave us a tour, took us through the bookstore, invited us to go out evangelizing with them on Saturday, which we did. Went down to a part of London where they were doing some open-air preaching, and we passed out tracts. And um, on Sunday after church, we went to a fellowship with uh, Helen and her husband and some other people in the church and, um, uh, and one of the really interesting things that they do at that church um, and th this, is, this is not a, a lesson about Peter Master's church but I can't help but share some of this stuff um, so it's in, it's in the middle of London and they have uh, a Sunday school that they do in the afternoons where they have I can't remember if it was 500, I think it was 700 uh, inner city kids who come to a Sunday school on Sunday afternoons. And the whole church is wrapped up in, you know, teaching, organizing. One, one, part of what they do is they go door to door in London inviting kids to come to their Sunday school. And um, often the parents are like, yeah, 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 take them. You know, um, but yeah. So I, the, the, I can't even imagine how many people it would have taken. You know, how many members would have been involved in teaching that many uh, young kids a Sunday school. Um, and then we went to the evening service, and it was interesting because Peter Masters. Um, we talked for I don't know maybe 15 minutes, and. Um, he shared, he said, you people in America have this all wrong uh, as far as Sunday school goes. You pull people out of the service for the, during, the, during the church service for Sunday school. This is how you should do it, you know. Um, so maybe it's food for thought for us, but um, it's, I mean, imagine the impact that they're having with these uh, over the years, thousands of young people who, who their, their only exposure to the Christian faith uh, is likely, you know, the effort of that church. But so you can take the picture down and, you know, the show and tell is over. Um, in, his, in his book on church membership, He's got a chapter, and I, so uh, are we passing out the copy of the lesson? Does everybody have that? Pardon? 
Um, it's really what I also. I've lost my coffee. There it is. Wait. Uh, Brian, would you? There you go. I'm getting cotton mouth up here. Thank you, sir. So he's got a chapter in the book on loyalty to the local church, and that's really what I've put into the into the handout that you have is essentially I've I've lifted the first part of the chapter and 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 you know reproduced it here, and then and then there's an outline of the rest of the chapter, and so we're going to try to go through this. Um, as much as we can this morning. Um, so the lesson really is not so much about the necessity for church membership, but we want to talk about that just a minute before we get into this issue of loyalty. Um, <clears throat> you can't live out your Christian life apart from being with people in a church. You can't love one another in the way that we're called to do um, and, and really uh, hold each other accountable in the way that we're called to do. And um, So a couple of... Uh, thoughts about church membership. Pastor Michael wrote this definition years ago when he was teaching essentials. He said, church membership is a visible expression of one's union with Christ and his bride, whereby a professing follower of Jesus Christ formally commits to join, serve, support, and submit to one local assembly and its leadership laboring to obey God's will for the edification of the body of Christ and the salvation of the lost to the glory of God. There's a lot in that. Um, and we'll, we'll delve into some aspects of it this morning. Um, John MacArthur said this about church membership. Living out a commitment to a local church involves many responsibilities exemplifying a godly example in the community, exercising one's spiritual gifts in diligent service, contributing financially to the work of the ministry, giving and receiving admonishment with meekness and in love, and faithfully participating in corporate worship. Much is expected, but much is at stake. For only when every believer is faithful to this kind of commitment is the church able to live up to her calling as Christ's representative here on earth. To put it simply, membership matters. We see in, um, I'll point you to a, a couple of um, passages. Uh, if you would look at um, Acts um, two <clears throat> and verse forty seven. <clears throat> Excuse me. We see there at the end of that the and the the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. And so there's a definite number that are identified. Uh, it's not a uh, just a, a, a loose, easy, uh, you know, undefined kind of thing. It's a specific number. The Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. And one really interesting thing about um, church membership that um, our 1689 points out, if you have it with you, um, 
turn to chapter 26. And I'll just point you to sections 5, 6, and 7. Uh, so in the Confession, chapter 26, section 5. In the exercise of the authority which has been entrusted to him, the Lord Jesus calls to himself from out of the world, through the ministry of his word, by his spirit, those who are given to him by his Father, so that they may walk before him in all the ways of obedience which he prescribes to them in his word. Those who are thus called, he commands to walk together in particular societies or churches for their mutual edification and for the due performance of that public worship which he requires of them in the world. And the, the particular thing I wanted to point you to here is... Um, so that they may walk before him in all the ways of obedience which he prescribes to them in his word. The, and then the next, the next sentence, um, those who are thus called he commands to walk together in particular societies or churches for their mutual edification, for the due performance of that public worship which he requires of them in the world. And the proof text there is Matthew 18 which is the section that we know about as uh, being r related to church discipline. Um, and church discipline, you know, begins with uh, making sure that there's nothing between you and your brothers or sisters. Um, and so we, we, we're blessed to be part of a church where church discipline is practiced. And in fact, as we'll see in Peter Master's chapter on loyalty to the local church, one of the things that he says is, uh, you know, if, if a church doesn't practice church discipline, leave it. <laughs> um, but, it, it, so it tends to have this sort of negative, you know, uh, thing. A lot of churches stay away from it, um, but it's it's really about preserving unity and true fellowship, and you know, not letting small things turn into big things. And um, we're here to worship. God together. And, you know, we can't do that if we're hating each other. Um, but in the in so in church discipline, what we see is that you know there there are people all you know if they're unrepentant uh, and, and refuse to hear their brothers, refuse to hear the church, they're put out of the church. So. This, this idea of church membership and the necessity of church membership is, is um, reinforced by and, and supported by Matthew 18. Um, and, and you know there are other passages in the Bible about discipline, putting people out and restoring them and so, so church membership is, is crucial. There's, not, there's nowhere it says, you know, you must be a member of a church, but, but the implication and the inference and all of the other ways that we see in which the Christian life is lived out um, assume church membership. But so the, the main thing we want to talk about today is loyalty. And the issue that often comes up um, in the course of our lives where, uh, especially in this country and especially in our, in our world today where, you know, people are constantly moving and, you know, the jobs are changing, the economy is changing, the world is changing. Uh, I was going to say the climate's changing, but... Uh, <laughs> uh, 
uh, John MacArthur did a sermon recently where he, he, he basically skewered all of the current thinking about the big threats to the to the country and said the biggest threat to the country is the government. But um, let's see, where was I? <laughs> Loyalty. So, you know, one of, one of the, uh, we're inclined to think in a worldly way. Uh, I, I did this years ago. Um, I worked for Golf Week for 10 years and got laid off in 2007. Is Tom Matugi here? Tom, there's Tom. I've told this story about Tom many times, but. Um, I, and so I, you know, I've been a journalist for uh, uh, forever, and it's the only thing I thought I really knew how to do. And so, uh, you know, I got laid off, and I started sending out resumes, and I got a job offer in North Carolina. And <laughs> um, I was inclined to go there. We'd been here two years. This, this was 2007, and I was telling Tom about this, and Tom said, "Well, what are you going to do about a church?" Yeah, and uh, you know, I, I naively was like, "Well, I'm sure there's a good church up there somewhere." And you know, really, the more I thought about that question, um, and the more I thought about how I had wandered, wandered for so long from one bad church to another. Uh, and had found a true church where there was a high concentration of genuinely converted Christians, uh, the more it, you know, the more difficult it, be, it began to, you know, uh, uh, as I thought about leaving, I was like, this is, I don't know, I don't know, maybe I don't know if I can do this. Like, I, finally I found a true church. I, I need to rethink this, and so I, I did, and uh, you know, by the grace of God, you know, um, made the right choice to stay. Uh, changed careers, uh, which at fifty was, you know, a little nerve-wracking. Um, Started a business in a field I knew almost nothing about, um, <laughs> and uh, so that was that was 2008, and I'm so glad that I did. Um, and the Lord has 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 blessed th that decision and that choice in many ways. Um, and this is this so this gets at a point that that Peter Masters makes in this chapter, which is that your first inclination when a difficulty comes into your life that um, makes it appear to you that your first and best choice is to move away, um, uh, don't do it. Uh, he's, uh, he speaks of proving the Lord. Um, and, and he speaks of it too as being a, uh, a way that Satan often works in pulling people away from where they're supposed to be. So... With that sort of as an introduction, let's look at um, let's look at what what so, so Peter Masters makes makes the point in the chapter that there are times when it is you know the Lord is calling someone to make a move to another place and. Uh, that that does happen. He's not saying that you know, regardless of whatever is going on, never do it. There are times when that is clearly it's the Lord is 
is uh, orchestrating the circumstances in your life and, and moving you to another place because he has a purpose for you there. So that may, that may happen, but you know, you need to really look carefully and think carefully and prayerfully about whether that is in fact what's happening um, and not let uh, worldly influences be the thing that really causes you to move away. And that's really where he starts in this lesson. So if you, don't, uh, if you would just refer to this at the beginning, this quote that I pulled out at the top, he says, when the next trial arises in our lives, will we have the right priorities? Many fall in the time of trial without even a struggle, and consequently they may suffer years of unhappiness without real spiritual usefulness. Some have gone into a spiritual wilderness because matters of career or location become the biggest influence in their lives, causing them to abandon their place in the service of the Lord. Um, and so I, I encourage you to read this thing. I'm just going to highlight a few things that he says. This is, is, is counter-cultural. I mean... Um, I even even though uh, 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 my own experience was, you know, as I described it, you know, inclined initially to um, just move. You know, I got bills to pay, I got a mortgage, you know, all this stuff, and uh, 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 it's taken me a while. And still, I, you know, as I see people leaving. Um, with every year, I see the gravity <laughs> more clearly of this issue of loyalty to your church and not treating this lightly. And partly that's because we've seen a number of people leave for really simple preference and you know, worldly kinds of considerations, and things often don't go well for them. Um, I, th I remember that uh, there was a, not long after we, Marion and I made the decision to stay here, there was a couple who, who had been in the church and had moved to North Carolina and had been, had been up there for two or three years and had gone to like 50 churches. And some of you who have been here a long time remember them. Um, and came back, you know, threw up their hands and just said, we can't find a decent church up there, you know, and, and moved back to Orlando. I'm not sure where they are now, but uh, I was like, hmm, maybe that's another indication from God that uh, it's a good thing I didn't go. Um, So, so, so Masters points to two things in uh, the section, a low or high view of the church. Um, the first is 1 Corinthians 12. Um, and so in your handout, it's near the bottom of the first page, I'm going to read. He says, uh, the New Testament is clear in its portrayal of the local church as a company of believers very strongly related together in bonds of love and loyalty and service. The local church is much greater than a haphazard collection of believers. It is a spiritually integrated family vested with unique privileges and authority to carry out the commands of its head, the Lord Jesus Christ. A local church is the object of his delight, and he is, is especially protective towards it. The local church is, as Paul says repeatedly in 1 Corinthians 12, one body. In the 18th verse, he says, Now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body as it hath pleased him. In other words, God has designed each congregation As, as people have left uh, here, this is a point that we've tried to emphasize to them. Um, 
it's no accident that you're here. I mean, this is where God brought you. This is where he has put you. Um, and that's something that should weigh heavily in any kind of, you know, decision that you might make about whether to leave. Um, Masters goes on to say, we therefore conclude that if any are removed other than by the design and overruling of the Lord, some vital quality will be missing. The members care and feel for one another to the extent that when one suffers, all the others suffer also. The congregation has a special place in the purposes of God. Um... And, you know, one, so in, in, in 1 Corinthians 12, the, the analogy is of the body and of all of the parts of the body and the um, function that each one has. And some have more visible and seemingly more important functions and others have what seem to be, you know, less visible and seem to be less important functions, but they're not. They're not less important. Um, in, in Master's book, he talks about, uh, you know, the hands versus the feet. Or the hands are, you know, much more useful in many ways than the feet. Like, you can't do everything with your toes that you can with your fingers. But the feet hold everything up. <laughs> and so even though they seem like lowly um, members there, equally as important. And so your function here, you, you may not fully appreciate your own importance to the congregation, but God brought you here for a purpose and he equipped you with certain gifts that you're to use for the edification of the body. Um, and it's... As he says in this next paragraph, Ephesians, uh, he refers to Ephesians 4.16, which describes the organic unity of the congregation using the most uh, close-knit illustration available, that of the physical body. Under the direction of the head, the whole body, fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. The idea of joints and limbs being freely interchangeable between different bodies is unthinkable. You know, our removal uh, from a church should be unthinkable to begin with. I mean, if that is not how you feel about the church, then there's something off about the way you feel about the church. Um, he goes on to this, some really powerful um, uh, illustrations here, but... Um, um, the notion that a, a knuckle or elbow could unilaterally migrate to another body is ludicrous. The illustration of the body shows how seriously God takes his sovereign right to place his people in particular churches according to his overall plan. Our God insists that we see our lives and our service in the context of the particular church family to which he appoints us. Um, so he takes in, in the next part of this chapter and he talks about this, the body of Christ. And what, what should, how, how does the uh, idea of the body of Christ relate to the question of whether we should ever move? Um, and he makes two points. Um, 
in, in the section called Encouraging Loyalty. So it's, I don't know, two or three pages in. Um, two concepts arising out of the expression the body of Christ should help us to develop the supportive, devoted attitude which we ought to have for our local church. The magnificent term used in 1 Corinthians 12, 27 may refer in scripture both to the entire worldwide church of Christ and to an individual congregation. As we have seen, the term speaks of a harmonious, closely organized unit with interdependent parts and limbs, but it also speaks of a person's presence. So bear with me, I'm gonna read this. So he's got two points that he's gonna make here. One is, just as we are present in, the, in a place when our body is there, so Christ is seen in the world by his church. Every local church is his representative body in the world. Surely then, the local church as his representative body must be treated with the utmost respect and consideration. As members, we are the body of Christ. Whatever we do for his representative body, we do for him and to him. Whatever we fail to do for the church, we fail to do for him. If I am lazy or indifferent toward my church, the body of Christ, I am lazy and indifferent to him. If I am disloyal to his body, I am disloyal to him. How can I hurt the body of Christ or abuse it? How can I lightly leave or forsake it? So is that, is that how you think about the body of Christ? Uh, is that how you think about the people you're here with? Like you're an integral part of their lives. And um, you know, I, 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 can, I think of I think of many people over over the years who have left, and um, this one in particular, on her way out, was like. Well, I really love you all, but I'm out of here and I'll never see you again. You know, I mean, it couldn't, you can't, it's not, it can't possibly be that way. You, you know, you can't really love the people here and simply leave and never look back. Um, then he goes and talks about the body of Christ in a, in a different in a different way that was um, st stunning, really, the first time I, I read this. Um, he says, to further stir our loyalty to the local church, there is a second idea suggested by the term body of Christ. It is that of the sanctity of life. The word body reminds us that the local church is a living thing. Support Supposing we see a person lying in the street, injured and bleeding, what do we do? Do we just pass by? If we do, we will afterwards feel sick and desperately ashamed because there is within everyone a powerful respect for life and we cannot betray that instinctual responsibility for the preserving of life without paying a price. As Christians, we should possess a similar instinct for the health and well-being of the body of Christ, the local church. Viewed spiritually, it is a precious living body, Christ being alive in its members, having bound them together to represent him in the world. How can we allow it to be hurt? How can we bear to see limbs torn out? The world allows and encourages abortion, which is an outrage against the sanctity of human life, but the indifference shown by some believers to the body of Christ is to some degree a similar outrage in the spiritual realm. Um, that's a, it's a, it's pretty, putting it in a pretty, pretty strong language. Yes, Linda. Okay, so um, I see how he's trying to say that like the body of Christ can be used in two ways. 
like as the universal body, all the Christians, and also as the local church. Um, could you help me to see how it's used like as a local church? Like, um, because yeah, I guess that's, that's my question. Um, well, I and mean, what comes to mind is 1 Corinthians 12. Um, let's look there. So in the first part of, of 1 Corinthians, he's talking about or, or, or chapter 12, spiritual gifts um, and why we're given these gifts to edify each other. Um, and then starting in verse 12, for just as the body is one and has many members and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable, and on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow greater honor, and our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. So you know, how is the local church the body? It is because we have this interdependent um, life. Um, and we need each other to function as Christians. Um, so there's, there is a universal church, a universal body, the, all Christians, the invisible church everywhere, but uh, in the way that this interdependence is described, it's, it's because we're together. Um, and, you know, when you think about those verses that I referred to at the beginning, which talk about this particular number or uh, being inside or outside this particular group, um, those are all local churches. So, I don't know, does that answer your question? Tom? The interdependence described in the body is not cannot be seen in the universal body, right. but rather in the local body, in the local congregation. That's where you can see that need for one another, and that um, the references that he's given here, where he says in verse 23, and those members of the body which we think are less honourable, on these we bestow greater honour, and our unpresentable parts have greater modesty but our presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body, having given greater honor to that part which lacks it, that there should be no schism in the body and that the members should have the same care for one another. Mm -hmm. And so that same care for one another would not be seen in the universal body, 
but rather in the local body. All right. Yes. Immediately. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so he goes on to say here at the end of this section, and when church members uproot and move as though their place in the body of Christ is of no significance, it is because they have lost their sense of awe and respect for the local church as the body of Christ. What a precious and important thing the congregation is. It is far, far more than a convenient arrangement. It is something to which we owe special love, loyalty, service, so long as it remains a worthy church. So I, I hope that, you know, at least to think about those things will serve as a counterweight to what could be your inclination. Uh, the next time there's a diff, you know, you lose your job, <laughs> um, like I did, or um, you know, there's there's some other trial or difficulty. Um, d don't. I mean, that is the time to pray and trust the Lord. Um, and you you you. You know, your 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 natural inclination may not be to do that. <laughs> um, so I've outlined, and in, in if you look at the turn the page, the next there, there are one, two, four sections where you know he, he the rest of this chapter he talks about wrong motives for leaving, when loyalty is challenged, when loyalty is wrong and when loyalty is wrong toward doctrinally sound churches. So wrong motives for leaving. We've got about 10 minutes. I'm gonna run through these fairly quickly. A natural desire for more pleasant districts. Uh, you know, um, there's too much congestion in Orlando. Uh, the summers are too hot. Um, what else? I don't know. The beach is too far away. <laughs> um, I like the mountains better. Uh, that is not a biblical motive for leaving. Um, some besetting weakness that could not be controlled. Um, Uh, you know, I, I just haven't been able to resolve this issue here, so I'm going to go somewhere else and start over, and maybe I can fix it there. Uh, that's not the way to deal with it. Um, and third, think people thinking more highly of themselves than they ought to think, becoming upset that their perceived talents are sufficiently recognized um, and that they're not given any res early respect or office. Um, but I want to sing solos during the worship service. I've got a great voice, and you're not letting me do that. So I'm going to go somewhere else. Um, then this, when loyalty is challenged, the practice of loyalty to a local church has brought many people a series of wonderful provisions and blessings. Uh, you know, that, that I'm exhibit A as far as I'm concerned to that. Uh, if, if I had done what I thought I should do, which was stay in the publishing business, boy, what a mess that would have been. Um, <laughs> The Lord has, has uh, it was not, it's, it, it's not gonna, it may not be easy. Like the hardest thing I've ever done in all my life was start a business. Um, was that an amen? Or, um, but, you know, the Lord is, has, has blessed that. Um, and so you're, you know, I, I'm encouraging you, Peter. Masters would encourage you. Your, your elders here would encourage you that when when there is this kind of a situation, 
your first thought should be, I'm anxious to see how the Lord is going to work in this circumstance to bless me. Uh, because uh, unless it's abundantly and overwhelmingly clear that you should go somewhere else, like is the case with Pastor Jerome going to Dahabon, um, that should not be your, your first thought. Um, the history of the church is full of the loyal sacrifices of the Lord's people. Um, you know, I, I mean, the, the other thing is like, suppose you did lose your job and you didn't find one for a year here. Do you think that this church would let you starve or be homeless? I mean, that's not going to happen here. You, you know, you have many brothers and sisters and fathers and mothers and all of that here. So, uh, you know, it, it may be that the purpose in that will be uh, for us to show our own love toward you and your difficulty. Uh, and you just departing off someplace and uh, wouldn't, wouldn't allow that to happen. And I mentioned this earlier, but number four here, all believers at some time are likely to be subjected to the devil's attempts to shift them from the church fellowship where God has placed them. Most believers who have been especially used by God for the building up of their fellowship have been at some time subjected to intense pressures to uproot and relocate elsewhere. Satan is constantly trying to spoil churches by taking believers out of the element in which God has placed them. So you, you, this, should, this should enter your thinking. This, like, you should think this way about these kinds of difficulties. Um, what, is this a, a satanic effort to derail your Christian life by pulling you out of a good church and taking you off to some place where you don't know what, what you'll find? When the Lord sets us in a sound church, it is a divine appointment, and we must honor and respect that with all our strength. Um, when loyalty is wrong, and the main two things um, he refers to 1 Timothy 6, 3-5, if anyone teaches otherwise sound doctrine and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which accords with godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words from which come envy, strife, reviling, evil suspicions, useless wranglings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. From such withdraw yourself." Uh, you're in a sound church. Like, um, some of you are blessed to have, this is like the first church you were ever part of. And you don't know what a mess there is out there. Uh, <laughs> uh, I've been in some of those messes, and by the grace of God, uh, you know, he, he pulled us out of them. Um, but, so if they're teaching error, you know, you, and so you have to know, like when we talk about um, leadership in the church, um, you're the ones who keep the leadership accountable. You must know your Bible in order to do that. You should not just sit there and expect to be spoon fed, you know. Um, you need to be Bereans about this. You need to... Uh, we are men who can be wrong. And I mean, we, it's, we take this very seriously and make every effort not to be, but um, you have a responsibility. Um, and then 2 Corinthians 6, 
14 to 17, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers for what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness. Um, so, you know, teaching wrong stuff, uh, you know, unbiblical garbage, and there's a lot of it. Um, beware. Then, you know, when loyalty is wrong toward doctrinally sound churches, I mean, so they can teach all the right things but not do them. Um, when a church refuses to practice church discipline. I, don't know, has any, I wonder if anybody's ever actually left a church. Surely they have, but because they didn't practice. I mean, most people leave churches because they do practice church discipline and they're offended by it. Um... <laughs> If a church shows no inclination to obey the Great Commission. I, I mean, I left First Baptist Orlando because uh, well, one principal reason was I didn't, I, I didn't even have, an, I didn't even know what Reformed theology was uh, at the time. So I'm really glad I left and discovered it. But um, they said, in effect, we don't want you going door to door because it's too confrontational. Okay, I got to get out of here. <laughs> um, and, and if a church ignores the standards of God's word by allowing the use of carnal and worldly styles of worship. So you've heard us talk about the regulative principle and the red circle is flashing. Um... There are, there are other really great treasures in this little book. Um, one of them, the, the last chapter, The Rules of Church Membership. And it's uh, Principles of Conduct for Church Members compiled in the 1740s by John Fletcher. Um, and I, 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 I thought about starting with some of these, but um, I won't. Let's, uh, let's pray and we'll move on. Father in heaven, thank you for our time together and um, we thank you for uh, this precious church, um, for how you've worked in our lives and circumstances to bring us here. Um, help us, Lord, to um, fully appreciate um, what an amazing blessing it is to, to be here. In Jesus' name, amen.